Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I have world-renowned reproductive immunologist, Dr. Andrea Vidali on today's show. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon, Amy. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I've, of course, I've known so, I've heard so much about you and I know about you, about your work and your research and what you're doing for patients. So very excited to actually have the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Thank you for making the time. I have to tell you that there's probably only one doctor that I probably get a message about at least once a week saying, you have to get Dr. Vidali on your show. So this is like a long time coming. So thank you again. So for those of you who don't know who Dr. Vidali is, I want to introduce you guys to him and just share a little bit about his bio. Like I said, he's a world renowned reproductive endocrinologist, reproductive immunologist, and endometriosis specialist, surgeon, miscarriage specialist. And he's also the founder and CEO of Pregmune. And that's what we're talking about today, you guys, a healthcare information company that leverages his research in the fields of IVF, miscarriage, and immunology all in one place. He also founded two other companies, the Braverman Reproductive Immunology and the Endometriosis Summit. He completed his medical degree at age 23, you're kind of like Doogie Hauser, at the University of Padova in Italy and went on to complete a residency program in OBGYN at Georgetown in Washington, DC and a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology at Columbia. You also carried out important research both in the surgical and IVF fields And in 1998, you published one of the earliest reports of egg freezing for fertility. That's pretty darn awesome. And in the same year, because you weren't already busy enough, you also published one of the earliest papers on laparoscopic myomectomy for fertility patients. And I'm so happy to have you talking to us about Pregmune and immunological factors and fertility. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I'd just like to make a just a very simple correction, not a correction, but a, you know, the the you mentioned Braverman, and that's Dr. Braven, who was my partner and the founder of Brain Reductive Immunology. And he unfortunately has passed away two years ago. And he was, you know, besides being a friend, he was a, a genius, a literally genius. And, you know, we should give him the credit. And also another person who deserves the credit is Dr. Sally Sorrell, who is the co-founder of the Endometriosis Summit with me. So I just need to make sure that these two people get the credit because they are both amazing people. That's lovely. I'm glad you did that. So I want to hear more about you and what brought you to the field of fertility. I mean, you made the choice pretty early in life. What interests you about this field from that young of an age? This moment in time when IVF was just starting and I was a young resident at Georgetown, that's when it, it caught my attention and I felt the excitement. I felt the, 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 the new thing coming up and, and how everybody wanted to be part of it. And of course, I wanted to be part of it too because of the science and, and the novelty of the scientific discoveries. And that's what led me to the world of fertility. So that's what happened basically. Wow. And, uh, so, and after that, you know, I went to Colombia and that was also like a, a very uh, exciting time. In fact, we have a minute of time. I have a little anecdote for you, which is that the first IVF cycle ever was actually done at Columbia University, but it never came to fruition because what happened, this is before, you know, as everybody may or may not know, uh, the first IVF was actually done in, in, in the UK, right? Uh, Dr. Steptoe and Edwards, Nobel laureates for the first IVF cycle. But a lot of centers were trying to do IVF at the time, right? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just the only center, the one in the UK. And what happened is that at Columbia at the time, uh, there was a, I don't remember the name of the embryologist, but a great innovator. And uh, the guy was like, I'm going to do IVF. And uh, the, so what happened that day, uh, the, the, um, the patient was a Cornell, actually. They did a laparotomy, open surgery, believe it or not, people. And they took the eggs out. And then the doctor who did the retrieval. I don't remember his name. Sorry, guys. But there's actually an episode of This American Life talking about this thing. Uh, 
Uh, the doctor took his car, as you, you may, if you're in New York, you know that it's uh, Cornell is on the Upper East Side, and drove all the way up to Columbia University, up on 168th Street on the Upper West Side, brought the eggs to the doctor. Uh, gosh, I, for, I wish I remember the name of the embryologist. Anyway, if you, you could look it up. And uh, they fertilized the eggs and put them in the incubator. But at the, this is... This is the age before there was consent. You know, this was done like this, right? You know, uh, spontaneously. The patient, of course, was in full agreement. And uh, the chair of the department at the time was Dr. Professor Van de Ville, who was a traditional, he was a Dutch guy, very traditional. He was like, Colombia, we cannot be the first people doing this. This is too risky for us, this baby, test you baby. So he went in at night. He took the embryo, he opened the incubator and he threw the embryos out of the window of the 16th floor uh, of Columbia University. And uh, so it was actually a huge scandal. The patient actually sued Columbia University and there was a very public trial about this. And uh, they, you know, they got some sort of monetary compensation. But this is like a little bit of a tiny bit of history of uh I, the IVF that many of many of you uh, today may not know about, but of course I knew about it because I was I came like a little bit after that, right. and uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Nabil Husami, who also and a former partner, a wonderful person, Dr. Husami, Nabil Husami, who passed also a few years ago, um, and uh, a wonderful person. He was there at the time. He was a fellow, so he's the guy who told me about the story, and then I found out about it. Sorry for the digression, Amy, but I, I no, I this love is an it. Interesting it? factoid, yeah. That is an interesting factoid. I had no idea, no idea. Wow. And I want to talk more about your role and how you are a leader in the field of reproductive immunology. And I hear from so many patients this question, Doctor Amy, how do I know if I'm attacking my baby and my body is actually attacking my baby. And I know that might be triggering for some people to hear, but those are the words that my patients actually hear. And so I'm so happy to know that you've created Pregnune. And I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about more about that and we'll get into it. But before that, when, when we think about immunology and reproductive immunology and, and the immunological factors that can play a role, what do you mean? And what what kinds of factors do fertility patients really need to consider? Well, um, let's just first, uh, I'd like to first start with this, what you just mentioned, which is what your patients, our patients tell us, which is, it's really an intuition, right? It's an intuition. The patient tells you, the individual tells you, something is not right here. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we have to be careful because intuitions are not always right. Right. Sometimes one can have an intuition and it's and it's and they're wrong. But um, in this case, there is actually a lot of evidence that these intuitions are actually true. Um, one example I can make you is and I'm sure you hear this all the time is sometimes somebody is pregnant. As soon as they get pregnant, they start having rashes all over their body. They swell up. Rashes. Um, they feel inflamed. Something is going on. This is, it's not very common, of course. These are like more extreme cases, but we, we do hear these, uh, uh, these, uh, these, these stories. And of course, stories can be an, uh, anecdotes. And, you know, of course, this is not how science is made. But the reality is that this intuition that people have is actually correct. Because there is, and it's not correct for everybody. Like I said, you can't base it on that. What, what I'm trying to say is that what happens in pregnancy is that there is an interaction between, between two entities. One entity is the carrier, uh, the mother, if you will, uh, the parent. And the other entity is the baby, the embryo. Okay, These two entities are actually have something in common but not everything, right? Because 50% of the genetics comes from the other, from the, from the father, the other partner, the male partner. And uh, so why, why is this, why can this be a problem? Because obviously there, there is a natural, we call, we call the embryo a, a semi allograft right? You know, an allograft is a transplant, right? So we, you have to think of the baby as if you would think of a kidney. Not exactly. I'm just making a, a transplanted kidney. I'm making an, 
a comparison which is not 100% correct, just to understand that. We call that a semi-allograph. What that means is that half of the genetics of the baby, of the embryo, comes from the other parent. And now, uh, obviously, there are mechanisms in place to prevent the rejection because the natural reaction of the body would that be to reject something that's foreign to the body, right? But there are obviously immunological mechanisms in place. And uh, we call these immunological mechanism the development of tolerance, tolerance towards these antigens. And how does tolerance get developed? The way in nature, normally tolerance get developed by actually uh, sexual interaction when actually the sperm enters the body. And uh, the sperm obviously contains the DNA of the other parent, right? And uh, as the sperm enters the uterus, these sperm cells, these cells are recognized by certain specific cells, you know, they're called antigen presenting cells. And these cells identify the, the, these specific antigens on the sperm. And they present, they present these antigens to other cells inside the body, uh, immunological cells, immune cells, so that the immune system uh, develops progressively a tolerance towards these, uh, these foreign antigens. And actually, there are studies that show that whenever these phenomena do not happen, whenever people, for example, do not have sex, that's one, one of the examples would be using a, a donor, donor sperm. Uh, in that case, uh, we have seen that some of these tolerance mechanisms can be you know, slightly altered. You know? And so... Um, this mechanism of tolerance is very important, and but it can be disrupted. It can be disrupt. How can this be disrupted? It can be disrupted in different ways, right? You know, it can be disrupted by a hyperactive immune system. Uh, there, there are such things as autoimmune conditions, and some people have autoimmune conditions. Uh, they're more common in women than in men, and uh, one of the reasons why this happens is because. The immune, the, the immune system uh, of a genetically female person is that is, is more plastic it change, because of the pregnancy, right? There's more plasticity and there's more on and on, on and off switches. And when you have more on and off switches, the switch can, can break. And so that system breaks. So there's autoimmune conditions, right? You know, bona fide autoimmune conditions. The most common, of course, that we know about is, is uh, thyroid disease, so common right? Mm -hmm. Hashimoto thyroiditis, uh, but also lupus and, and, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other, other immune conditions. So there, there could be a, a hyperactive immune system that then in turn uh, disrupts the immune mechanism of tolerance. But there are also situations where sort of like, I call them in between because the, um, the, the movement between uh, health and it's a continuum, right? Health and disease is a continuum. It's not a, there isn't like a firm demarcation between health and disease. Often is that you're, you're healthy and then you're less healthy and then you're less healthy and then you're ill and then you're very ill, right? So the immune system functions the same way. And there are some people who find themselves in this in-between st state. And so uh, the focus of the field of reproductive immunology is to look at all of this that I just mentioned, basically, which is really the, 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 the mechanisms that control the interaction between the carrier, the mother, um, and the embryo, ultimately the baby, okay? And when you talk, and uh, additionally, uh, I, and I know that you, you spend a lot of time educating people about inflammation, right? Wh when, we talk, when we talk about the immune system, and we talk about immunology, we also talk about inflammation. And when we talk about inflammation, we also talk about nutrition, right? And so that whole other aspect plays an enormous role. And I like to mention that because I know that this is something that also in your practice, I'm aware that you really focus on, right? The, the inflammatory component, which is derived from different factors. One is the sort of like your your own natural immunity and disruption of that, but also, you know, what you put into your body, what you do to your body. And so, um, so I was very long winded, but I just wanted to give like sort of like a general perspective of what we talk about when we talk about this. Okay. Additionally, I would like to say that the field of the reproductive immunology is not new. It, this is a field that, that uh, is 
has been around for at least 50 years. There is a journal of reproductive immunology. Um, this is established science. One of the, the, the problems is that there's not as many doctors that focus on reproductive immunology. And this is because uh, medicine is very compartmentalized. So you have the, the immunologist that deals with like, quote unquote, immunological problems. You go to the immunologist if you have whatever allergies, blah, 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 right? Then you have the, uh, the other doctor, you know, whatever, the, repro the reproductive endocrinologist that deals with the reproductive issues. And sometimes there's not a lot of crosstalk. This is why, <laughs> you know, it's always a problem, right? You go to the, the uh, sometimes patient, in the, in, even in other fields of medicine, when you go outside of the specific field of the doctor, the doctors are confused. They tell you, look, I don't know anything about that. Like, Typical thing, you know, I don't know many times you get a call from the dentist that tells you, oh, I have to give anesthesia to, <laughs> for, to drill a tooth. And I'm like, why are you calling me? This is what you do every day. Why am I? But this is what it is. Medicine is very compartmentalized, right? You know, so that's all. I just wanted to give like a whole general view of what generally what we're dealing with when we talk about reproductive immunology. So I want to ask you a question. Do you think that a workup should be part of the standard at the outset? Like when you're first starting your fertility journey, let's mm -hmm. say, and you've gone through your IVF cycle and you've banked your embryos, should patients be also doing reproductive immunology workup in your humble opinion? Or is it something that you wait and do if let's say you've done everything else and let's, your first transfer doesn't work or your second transfer doesn't work? What is your opinion? Well, I'd like to say something, right? Which is there are guidelines, right? You know, there are guidelines. In fact, ASRM just released the guidelines for evaluation of the infertile patients. I don't know. They released it last week and, and I was just reading them yesterday and they're like no different than the guidelines that, you know, they were released a decade ago, almost, you know, like, and, and I'm like, really? Uh, uh, very basic, and I understand that. But you know, one of the issues that we have is that there is a an enormous time gap between guidelines that are determined by these organizations, and it's not just the ASRM. It could be the Royal College, it could be ESHRE, it could be the French Fertility Society, it could be the German Fertility Society, it could be the you know Chinese Fertility Society. It's not. You know, and one of the things about these guidelines, the first thing about it is that there's a gap in time, right? There's about an eight year gap between actually when actual good research is done and when it enters the guidelines, like a lifetime, you know, basically an enormous gap where uh, good evidence that is available is not introduced. That's a one, the one problem. And the second part is that there's tremendous discordance between different organizations. And, you know, you would think that, you know, all these different societies, which many of them, I mean, today everybody speaks English anyway, uh, read the same journals, read the same literature, you would think that it would be in agreement, but the answer is no, they are not, okay? So, um, so there's a difference between these, like, sort of standard, very sort of, like, um, standard guidelines that these, uh, that these experts put together. And let's just agree that these guidelines are made by people. Right. Usually it's like five or six. It used to be white men, you know, old white guys. I mean, I think things are improving a little bit, but not that much, trust me. So a bunch of old white men sit around the table and they are experts and they say, All right, this, including, I mean, of course, you know, uh, you have one of them here, but, you know, uh, but, you know, they sit around the table and they say, Well, we're experts and we're going to come to a consensus of what our interpretation of the evidence is. So like, I just wanted to explain to people today what these guidelines actually mean. So they're like the lowest common denominator, right? You know, like they're, they're just like, we're, we all agree on this. You know, we are arguing about a lot of things. We agree on that. So these guidelines have a tendency to be very vanilla, obviously, because it's obvious. The goal is to find something where everybody's in agreement, right? So this is the reason why when, when you look at these guidelines, they're very limited in what they recommend. Okay, so now let's get to your specific question, which is, when should one worry and, and be concerned and uh, consider doing the immunological testing or any other testing that's outside of these guidelines? And I'm not just talking about immunology, I'm talking about 
many other additional aspects, right? And, and my answer to that is it depends. I don't think one can say, I, I, you know, the guideline is typical for, it should be something for everybody, but not everybody is the same. Not everybody has the same priorities. And one of the things that is extremely relevant and important, I believe, is number one, the person's history. What is their history? What is their family history? What is their personal health history? Okay, not everybody has the same history. Some people have family histories of autoimmune conditions. Some people have personal history of autoimmune conditions. Okay, let's not forget the other part of it, which is very, very important. And I know this is very important is, is what is the age of the person? Because obviously, if I am 30 years old, I may have, I may think that I have all the time in my life, right? You know, and but if I'm 39, 40, 41, 42, obviously there's more, more pressure on, on my part because I'm aware that I have less time, less fertility time just because of the way nature works. And so I may welcome being more aggressive or may desire to be more aggressive. So the answer is that it depends. And I feel that uh, the a more aggressive, more detailed and, uh, investigation should be uh, should be performed on individuals who already have either a positive history or a positive family history or based on their age, ultimately based on their also, you know, sort of personal concerns, obviously, because sometimes people uh, and, and, you know, you know who you are, uh, they just don't feel like they just want to go into uh, one IVF cycle after the other, after the other, after the other, without um, investigating uh, a little bit deeper what the potential causes of the fertility problems or the miscarriages are, you know, and uh, and I know perspectives differs in, differ in these contexts, but uh, my perspective is that um, a, 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 an effort should be made in trying to identify potential causes of fertility. And the, the fertility should not be just a fertility treatment or, or miscarriage treatment should not just be a shake of hand and IVF. I mean, that's an option. I'm not saying that that's necessarily, uh, that should be excluded. It's certainly one path to take, but I don't think it's the only path. And, I, I, uh, I, want, I want you to help me dispel some myths about reproductive immunology. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've heard, and just because it's how I've been trained, and sometimes you carry those things that you, mm -hmm. from training into sure. your practice. And one of the things I was always told is that the false positive rate with any of this reproductive immunology testing is really high. Like 95% of the time, you'll just find something that's wrong and whatever is wrong. It's not evidence-based. Sure. And sure. based on that information, why even, you know, do the testing if you're going to find out that something's wrong, if it really isn't wrong. And then the other myth is that checking your peripheral and K levels really isn't a reflection of what goes on in your uterus. Can you speak to those things for us? Well, first of all, let's start with, um, Let's start first with uh, the role, you know, what immunological testing goes to look for. And, and then uh, we'll look into the, uh, the, the, you know, your, the specifics of your questions. Um, when you're looking at immunological test, when you talk about immunological testing, and in, more specifically, what, we'd, what I did in my own practice and now what applies to the current test that we do at Pregimmune, which is really an extension of that based on the science behind that. Um, the, uh, the, the testing focuses on different aspects. The first part is this compatibility part that we actually just talked about and uh, which uh, deals with how uh, the genetics, and I, I'm not going to go into the very, the genetics of the couple play into uh, the, the development of tolerance. And this deals with certain receptors that are on the surface on, of uh, really immune cells, you know, and, uh, and, uh, base, and these are genetically determined and how these interactions play. Um, and uh, that's that compatibility, this compatibility uh, component, uh, which is part of the major histocompatibility center, um, uh, system and, and uh, which is what is also used in transplant, uh, in transplant medicine. So people get, when we do the testing and when doctors do this type of testing, they get basically a full transplant high definition HLA testing. And uh, there is actually quite solid evidence about these inter interactions and uh, specifically 
um, when we're looking at, you know, HLA, a specific fragment of the HLA, HLAC, when we're looking at, uh, and, and there's quite solid evidence uh, about this. And, and uh, I think that a lot of this myth about uh, this comes from the early 90s. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, there was a kind of like a, a, um, a moment where immunology was sort of like looked negatively upon is that there was a certain treatment, uh, which is called the LIT procedure, L-I-T. Uh, it's a form of immunization, which uh, proved to be uh, uh, not very successful. And the FDA put a stop of it, to it. And that's sort of like the field kind of like sort of lost uh, its momentum but basically after that there's there's been 20 years of research so that first component is the genetic component the second component is looking at actual um a, a high evidence of uh, a hyperactive immune system and we're talking about the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies for example and there are specific conditions recognized condition called one of them called antiphospholipid syndrome, which is associated with very elevated level of antiphospholipid antibodies. Okay, so this is all, you know, very solidly established science. Okay, and, uh, and additionally, of course, we also look at the nutritional component. We look at, because uh, when we were looking at um, the role of intralipids, and we can talk about that in at another time, but we we're, very, we're not very convinced of, of the long-term effects of interlipids. So we actually, sh we, we looked at it and we look exactly what's happening from that perspective. When you're looking at uh, omega-3s, omega-6s levels and inflammatory parameters in, in um, uh, on a serological level, what happens there? And we actually looked at that and we added that part to our report. And um, now when you do a lot of tests, it, it doesn't matter what tests you do. It's like when you go to the doctor and you do your health test, you know, or whatever, your general, if you're the kind of person that goes to the doctor and does the yearly and the doctor draws a million tests on you, then one, one test comes back abnormal. Of course, unless it's a very important test, I don't know, like uh, something very relevant, uh, P PSA, the prostate, you know, the prostate antigen, very elevated. Okay. That, that can be very important, but if, if it's like a, one of the different parameters in your white blood cell is a little elevated, the doctor tells you, look, we did a hundred tests. That's not a big deal. Yes. I mean, there's truth to that, that if you do a hundred tests, you're not, you can't really make a determination usually based on one test. You know, the, the, the way this has to be looked at has to be holistic. You have to look at all the tests and what kind of clinical picture it depicts. This is the way to look at it. So this, and this is what we do at Pregimmune. Of course, we also use artificial intelligence to get to obtain a, a, a meaningful prediction of success and to identify who is at higher risk based on our original work of uh, original work that I had done in my clinical practice. So that's how we look at it. But certainly I wouldn't, we don't, you just can't base it on one single test that's off. And I think that was, it, of, of course, it's a reasonable a statement that, that you can't just base it on one single test, but it's not like that. You have to look at everything, like I said, holistically. One thing I'd like to add is that uh, there's been, and, and, I, and I've discussed this before, is that um, many, many studies on, uh, uh, on, the tr on immunological treatment for either recurrent pregnancy loss or implantation failure are done where and are done in Europe, mostly in Nordic countries, mostly because, you know, they have for some aspects, pretty good healthcare systems. I don't think they're amazing healthcare systems, but they're, they say for some aspects are good in the sense that they do provide medication for these treatments. And so there are some pretty good studies done in the Nordic countries utilizing uh, immunological medications, such as uh, uh, intravenous immunoglobulins and, uh, and, uh, and, and other drugs like that uh, in the context of randomized prospective studies. And... Uh, these these medications were provided for 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 free by the government, so they were able to do all these studies. Because these medications are very expensive, and the companies that make them they're, they're not they're not really interested in doing these big studies. In in the U.S., we don't really have a lot of studies in this area, but we do a lot of testing. So in the Netherlands, in all those places, they do they do the treatment without the testing, right? They treat based on condition. 
So you had three miscarriages or two miscarriages, you get the treatment. You had implantation failure, you get the treatment. Here in the US, we do testing, but then sometimes patients have less access to the treatment. So there, has been, there hasn't been a lot of crosstalk. And um, I was talking last week to prof- with Professor F- uh, Franz Klass, who is one of the greatest immuno- uh, immunologists of transplant. And we were just observing that. And one of the things we're trying to put together is kind of like communicate this type of information. So yes, there is like a lot of issues with communications and there's a lot of that. But I can tell you, I promise you, Amy, that many, many reproductive immunologists today are ordering immunological tests. They, they just sometimes don't know what to order. Sometimes they do it because from pressure from patients, the patients are demanding. You mean uh, reproductive these, endocrinologists? And, endocrinologists, yeah. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, many yeah. are actually yeah. doing the testing. You know, they're sending out right. the test. They just don't know how to interpret this. Some of them, you know, they just, they're like, oh, this is high. And, you know, we're, and, you, and you mentioned NK natural killer cells. And I think um, natural killers are, are, are very, everybody knows about natural killer. And I think it's because of the name, you know, right. like this, this killer thing gets into people's head and they're like, killer has to be bad. So if I have a lot of these killer cells cannot be good. In reality, the, the picture is much more complex. Okay. You know, natural killer cells are, are some, are cytotoxic cells that uh, are part of our innate immune system. They're, they're part of our, we, you know, our, we have two, our immune system is more evolved than, you know, in, in some other animal, you know, it, it's a more evolved immune system than a primitive immune system where we have this, we have a, an adaptive immune system where we can adapt to what gets thrown at us and build and build more immunity, but it takes time. Right. And that's what, you know, sort of vaccine works on, works on. And then we have this sort of natural immune system, which we're, that we have certain cells that they do not need to know what's coming at them. They will naturally attack uh, whatever sort of like offending agent, you know, bacteria, you know, uh, that comes and gets and attacks them or also, you know, potentially also cancer cells, obviously. And so these cells are sort of are part of the natural immunity. And uh, one of the uh, theories and uh, the association has been that people who have higher level of some subtypes of these natural killer cells uh, have, this has been associated with uh, increased recurrent pregnancy, recurrent pregnancy loss. As far as implantation failure, I'm not really sure that that's really that meaningful. And frankly, I'm not even sure that, you know, some of these connections are that, that meaningful. Um, also because one of the tests that gets ordered by doctors, they don't really order the actual levels of how many natural, there's many subtypes. There's many, depending on the receptors on the surface of these cells, there's many subtypes, but the doctors do not normally order how many of these cells there are. They order a test called NKA, natural killer cell activity, which measures the ability of your own blood natural killer cells, peripheral to kill a, a line, there's different tests, but it's a stimulation that of uh, certain cancer cells, hematological cancer cells. And so it's an in vitro test that tests the activity of these natural killer cells. It's not a very good test because like, as you know, a lot of these in vitro tests, they're so variable. You, there's so many different parameters that, that can go off. So it, in, in my personal medical opinion, the NKA is a test to do, but it's, you can't just base, base anything based on that. Okay. So I think it's very important that uh, we keep this into consideration. Um, I know that I, I mentioned in that test because a lot of people ask about natural killer cells and, uh, but there's a lot more to it. And like I said, the genetics is very important. And, uh, and so that's, that's why I think it's important to get a full clinical picture, a, 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 a much broader, much deeper analysis than what you could, one could do by just ordering that test. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. And you created Pregmune to help people understand their diagnosis and, and what may be playing into it. And so for doctors who are listening to this, because I know they're going to be reproductive endocrinologists that are going to be like, I need to learn more about this. When you see a patient and you provide a consult letter, I'm imagining the reproductive endocrinologist that's paying attention, I mean, that's taking care of that patient and doing their transfers will then look at it 
and then take care of any of the action items that you want for them. Can you just talk to me about that relationship between you and let's say me, for example, when I refer a patient to you and you've seen them and you make recommendations, how do things work? Well, here, here's how this works, right? You know, when, you, when, when a doctor orders this report, right? It basically, this is what I used to do. When I, when I was just a clinical practitioner, the doctors would refer the patient um, and I would order these tests, right? You know, and, and it would be done in a much more sort of less uh, sort of like sophisticated way. It was more like, you know, I would just, we would just look at these reports, sit around the table and analyze. Now it's much more automated. It's, it's, it's done with a greater sort of scientific, I would say, energy as well, uh, you know, approach. Um, uh, so uh, when we make these recommendations in the report, there's two levels of recommendation. One is a recommendation according to the standard organization, ASHRAE, ASRM, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, Royal College of Medicine. So as a physician, you get those recommendations, which are based on the quote unquote, let's call that the gold standard, right? You know, which is very stringent. And, uh, but, you know, you get those recommendations and you may choose to follow because let's remember that ultimately the, 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 the therapeutic decision ultimately is up to the doctor, right? And this is the way I, I see it because, because it is, I mean, like, you know, as a physician, you make your own recommendation. You may recommend the patient to do PGT or not, depending on different factors that are also based on your, on your, on, on medical consideration that you make the science and the patient's, uh, and the patient's uh, personal choices. So, uh, there, so you have the, those recommendations and then we have recommendation based on the literature, so on the current science. And, uh, and obviously those recommendations are gonna be a little bit different, a little bit more aggressive than sort of like what the other recommendations make. And then as a physician, you make your own considerations. You may say, look, I will make, and in, in conjunction with the patient, you have a conversation and you make your own decisions on how to treat this. You know, obviously when you're looking at the science and this is something very important because I like to discuss this, you know, when, we, when you're looking at the science, um, and by the way, I just noticed that I have my little cow there in the background and I wanted to show them because you're like, what is that, a dog or a cow? It's like a- I had a feeling it was a cow. I knew there was a story that went along with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fishing gave me that. It's like, a, it's a wonderful, a wonderful, I love it. I love cows too. Yeah. But um, the, uh, when, when, um, when, uh, when we recommend the treatments, we base it on randomized perspective trials, right? And in one specific drug has been used the most in many randomized perspective trials, and that's intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG. And that's, you know, that is an expensive medication, but obviously because we have to stick to this, you know, as a company, Pregimune has to stick to the standard of where the most randomized perspective trials were done. IVIG gets recommended more than anything else because it's, it's based on the science. There's, 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 there's obviously other treatments that are less, that, where there's less studies, but are used more frequent because of the cost. That is the dilemma in medicine that sometimes um, decisions, unfortunately, are made, are made also on cost. We don't make, you know, we all have to walk the earth, right? You and I and all of our patients, we all, we all have to pay our bills. And sometimes we also make medical decisions based on what we can afford. That's just the reality of life, right? And uh, so, for example, prednisone, which is, is basically, you can think of prednisone like a huge hammer that you hit on the head of the immune system, right? You know, prednisone actually works as an immune drug, right? You know, you, before there were more modern immunological treatment suppressant, you know, whenever people had transplant, they, they, they got enormous amounts of prednisone. They still use it, but in lesser amounts today because prednisone has a very deep and wide suppression of the immune system. But, you know, that's certainly also another inter alternative at lower dosages. So there's different approaches a doctor can do. But the answer to your question is that it's really up to the doctor. We give the tools. We give like a bird's eye view. And then, but then if you encounter somebody who has, you discover has rheumatoid arthritis, you discover somebody who has antiphospholipid syndrome, that's going to be a patient that you're going to say, well, you know what? Let me just talk, involve the rheumatologist. Let me involve some additional expert in this context, but at least you've helped the patient because you've given, like you've, you've been able to un, un add knowledge to what the actual problem was. You know, you've, you've made a diagnosis.
Right. And how do people work with you? So let's say they're not my patient and I haven't referred them. How do they get onboarded with Pregnune? Can you just talk to us about that? Well, how there's does a, the there's a website. It's very simple. It's called it's www.pregmune.com. I know it's, it's, uh, people, how do you spell it? It's preg like pregnancy, P R E G, right? And then immune, like, you know, it's you know, like immune, right? M U N E. It makes right? sense, like immune, pregnancy, preg immunity, right. preg so immune. That, that's really, sense. that's, and there's a website, pregmune.com. And uh, we do have, you know, ideally, your doctor, your doctor has to order the test because you, that's really the best way to do it. To be in direct communication with your doctor, I think, I think that's really the way to do it. You know, like, you know, it, we have ways because we have doctors almost in every state now, the way we do it. And we, we could order it anyway, but, and, and then you could take the report to your doctor. But I feel that, you know, the best way is to have a good report with your doctor. I mean, I think that's really key. Like, you know, and, and, uh, and I think that, I think that I, I what, I think one of the keys about your practice, uh, Amy, is, is what you do is that you listen to your patients and, and you listen to your patients' concerns. And I think ultimately um, it, this form of communication is very important, I think, to be able to be able to communicate to your doctor and, uh, and, uh, and have a feeling that your doctor is listening to your concerns. I think that's one of those things that are just there. And where do I order the labs from? Do I get a list? Do you send it it's to done, me? It's done for the patient. It's done. And the labs go to LabCorp, uh, which yeah. is a national level lab. Uh, most of the labs, only two labs go to another lab, which is part of Quest. Um, so it's a national level lab. Of course, I just like to mention the cost of this because, you know, there's a cost to labs anyway. I mean, if you go to any doctor and any doctor orders some of these tests, there will be you know, the insurance would, would be involved into paying for these labs, right? And as any of us know who have ever gone to the doctor, uh, the insurance says, well, you know, we'll, you have a copay. And, and a lot of it depends. It's the, it's the mysteries of health insurance, right? You know, which is if you call the first time, they tell you no. If you call the second time, they tell you yes. If you call the third time, they tell you, what is this? You know, it's a, there is some issues there sometimes with health insurance companies, but we work with the insurance companies to make sure that this is covered. And, uh, you know, every blood test, if you do not have insurance is expensive, but that's the reality of any blood test. It doesn't just deal with immunological mm -hmm. testing. So, so let's say I, I didn't want to use that. my, yeah, let's I say I just didn't want to use my insurance at all. How much? And I didn't want to bother with that. Or I have Kaiser, it's, for example, or an HMO. What would be the out-of-pocket well, for the panel? First of all, Kaiser or HMOs may cover, I mean, LabCorp. I mean, this is a national level lab, right? So that's really, um, sometimes you, you have to go to bat with these, you know, with the insurance companies and, and we do that. Um, but you know, we are, you know, unfortunately, if you had to pay out of pocket, it would be about $5,000, which is a lot of money. If you have no insurance at all, and uh, and uh, it's a, it's dramatic, and I understand that because it's very painful for people not to be able to you know get the care that they need that they need. But we are working you know really hard with insurance company to try to get like a lower flat fee for this testing. But that's the reality of blood not having of insurability in, in this country, which mm -hmm. is something that it's very hard to fix, unfortunately. No, it really is. So what? do you see as far as these levels and how it can impact a patient's fertility? Have you guys, you said, you mentioned very science-based and you have beautiful algorithms based on AI technology. Have you also then followed patients who've done, you know, the workup and then followed them we, forward well, as far as their success? The workup applies the science of reproductive immunology, right? So, you know, it's based on established science. So we do know what the impact of these treatments is on, recurrent pregnancy loss or, um, or implantation failure. So um, when it comes to uh, going, remember, we just launched. Now we're going to have the ability to follow more people, even more people prospectively, and uh, do even more studies and add to the existing evidence. But, you know, right today we're working with the existing evidence of of the treatment of reproductive immunology, which is established science, like we just said. So, um, so it's it's not like it, it's not like we um, 
are inventing something completely radically new. I just want to make it very clear. This is established science. This is something that exists and has been done for a long time. We're just making it more accessible to people and also giving people information. Because I think one of the big dilemmas for people, I think, is um, people who have had individuals who've had multiple, multiple pregnancy loss, and now they have two embryos left, right? Two PGS embryos left, one, one embryo left, PGS tested or not tested. In any case, they have very few embryos left and, they're, and they're, they've done many retrievals. And they're in a, at a point where they're going to say, well, look, I've had seven, eight transfers, no implantation. What's happening? Okay. What, what do we do at this point? I mean, do we go the direction of surrogacy or, or is surrogacy our only option? Is you know th these are very important decisions, and I think uh, because there's you know moral, uh, ethical, personal, financial huge considerations at this point. So I think this is also an area where I think getting as much information as you can really helps because if you have done this testing and you're in a very lower prognostic sort of like a a a area, this may help you make the decision and say, you know, what the heck, maybe we're going to go forward and use a surrogate, you know, option. Right. Um, and, and this is something I deal with every day. Yeah. And, and, and do you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Please, 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 please. Do you think we're going to get to the point where we're going to be doing HLA testing on embryos to help select better embryos to transfer or not better, but you know what I mean? Like better matching I, embryos. I, I, I've done, I've done that. Um, I, not on the embryo, but we've, for example, we've looked at, um, we have, we have actually, let me say that we have in certain cases done, uh, selected certain, um, specific, uh, types in HLAC in embryos in transfer, but not enough to create a big science, you know, like a scientific thing out of it. It's not something I would necessarily recommend today. I don't think the science is deep enough on this also because, one thing that we have to, rec to remember is that, and, and I think that this is very important for any sort of um, uh, intervention in medicine, you know, and I deal, as you, as you probably know, I deal with a lot of endometriosis as well. Interventions are incremental often, are often incremental, which means that you're, uh, whatever your number is, whatever you are, and then you, you know, you're adding to that you know, with a certain treatment. I mean, th this is an accepted concept, for example, in cancer, right? In cancer, you know, they're looking, they, they never look at specifically, cure. they look at cure, but for them, cure is a very long disease-free survival, you know, and there's also cure, of course, but most of the time they're looking at disease, incremental improvements, right? You know, longer. And, and I think that the same thing applies to fertility. You do these interventions, which are incremental, and they take you from where you are to a higher level and, you know, but it may not be hundred percent or zero. Unfortunately, the outcome is hundred percent or zero, which is really can be extremely painful. And uh, we know that uh, our patients have suffered probably, I mean, it's not the Olympics of suffering, but you know, many of the patients that I'm sure you see Amy have suffered the most, right? Because they've been through the most. Absolutely. I mean, by the time they get to us, they've gone through such tragedy. Mm -hmm that a lot of people can't relate to if you haven't had a 10th of what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Dr. Badali, thank you for your passion. Thank you for what you're doing. I mean, I, I really see that the platform that you have built and created will, you know, hopefully change the minds of doctors as well. And it will make this uh, field more accessible to fertility patients who just want someone to listen to their intuition. So thank you for all you do. I know my patients adore you and they're so grateful for you and the work that you do. So I just wanted to say that. And thank you for coming on the show today and teaching us so much about this field and providing such great stories and anecdotes, especially about that case at Columbia. That's crazy pretty stories. Wild. It's true. You can look it up. <laughs> the, the, you can look it up. It's you'll yeah. find out about it. And before we thank sign so off, much. Of course. Yes. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience members today? Uh, what I would, what I would like to tell you, and I always, I always tell this is that never accept unexplained as a cause of your either infertility or recurrent pregnancy loss. It's, it's my mantra. 
And uh, I think a quest for an explanation, you're all a quest. You may not get an answer. I mean, like that's the reality of it. But I think that I, I just never accept unexplained uh, as, a, as a first response to why things are not working out for you. On a repro- or in anything, <laughs> in anything. <laughs> oh, I, I I tell people there's no such thing as unexplained. It's just that no one explained it well enough, right? There's always possible explanations for every problem. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you again. I hope you'll thank join you. us. Thank you. Such again. a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you. And, and the, thank cow, the cow also says goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 